Hi, and welcome to the Handbag Designer 101 podcast with your host, Emily Blumenthal, handbag designer expert and handbag fairy godmother, where we cover everything about handbags from making, marketing, designing, and talking to handbag designers and industry experts about what it takes to make a successful handbag. Welcome, Amanda Cross, to Handbag Designer 101, the podcast. Amanda, you are the senior product designer for Stephanie Johnson, which is now under the Ricardo Beverly Hills umbrella. Thank you so much for having me today. Yeah. Oh, so excited to have you. You are in a very unique position, which we can dive right in, being a product designer for a brand that was actually acquired, and you actually work still work with the founder, Correct. Correct. Yes, we do still talk with Stephanie Johnson herself, and she does help give helpful pointers and her thoughts on what she thinks what we are projecting to move forward with. Is that weird? Like, you know, is it is it kind of like, you know, trying to sell an apartment with the owner still inside with the pictures on the wall saying like, hey, you know, this is how I do it and this is how I think it will sell or it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. Actually, I really enjoy working with her because we can get worked up in the busyness and thinking that, you know, something is the best option. But she knows and she's a outsider also that started the brand and she can hone in on certain things and help, you know, drive a certain direction in a way that is better that I don't see at the moment. So it's very helpful. And I really do enjoy working with her. And she's, you know, very friendly and very kind. She is. And very tall. All of the above. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Very beautiful. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. Well, obviously. So we had done kind of a pregame party yesterday talking about the brand. And we had spoken a little bit about how, you know, what is the DNA of a Stephanie Johnson brand? It is cosmetic bags, essentially. Obviously, it's more than that. But the brand was founded within this quote unquote niche of cosmetic bags. And to the outsider, one might say that that isn't very much. It's not fashion. But Stephanie, as I saw her a million years ago when she started and we were doing the same trade show circuit, she had a very small collection of fashion cosmetic bags and then it grew and grew and grew. So can you talk a little bit about the cosmetic bag industry and why there's so much value. And then, you know, don't sleep on the cosmetic bag because you never know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you go, you would think looking in the cosmetic industry, there's so much money in the cosmetic industry with makeup and just hair care and skincare, but there's not much fashion in it. And I feel like there's not much thought about how different organization can help. And women spend thousands of dollars on hair care and makeup. And we take that product and SJ herself, I think, was more about how to protect your product and different unique ways to organize your product within a small cosmetic travel container and bringing fashion to the table as well. So if you go to Target, there's you know a wide range of products that have good prints and that are viable to all customers, but we bring that more fashion element and those small details that I think a customer really appreciates and is honed into, especially when they're putting their prized possessions into this small bag. And it also is for travel and for just sitting on your countertop or your vanity in your bathroom. And it just kind of brings in a a light of happiness to your cosmetics. You're a trained designer though, right? this is what you do. You've been doing this for years. We can talk a little bit about your history. Is it strange as a designer to be thrust upon designing something that is so functional, right? Like when you're designing a traditional handbag, you have the luxury of throwing in like trend and fashion. Is yours mostly print driven? Is it materials driven? Or are you able at this point to still look at it at a holistic level as even a consumer is saying, hey, you know, I think there are ways to continue to build a better mousetrap. I would say that it's not hard at all. Actually, the further I get into my career as a designer, yes, you want those fashion elements and you want to bring in that fun, trending 
everything's always trending in a sense. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's just a cycle. Right. Of, but it's more of a challenge when you have something that's a square box or a circular case and you have to hone in on what is the consumer wanting to use it for. And we could come up with a bunch of, you know, designs that are very cool and fashion forward and unique shapes. But ideally, you have to come down to what is the customer using it for and what is the best way for the customer to use it? Because we could design many bags that look beautiful, but it comes down to the customer finding it useful and helpful to care for their products and hold them. And I really enjoy that as a designer. It's a challenge. I think that most designers don't get to experience just because they're designing more fashion forward things and not functional items. You know, that's such a good point. There's one of those sayings that if you ask someone to go up on stage and say, do whatever you want, that yeah. person will literally just stand there, you know, not knowing what to do. Should I jump? Should I swim? In? You know, should I spin? Should I squat? You know, there's a thousand things. But if you tell someone to go up on stage and say, jump, yeah. essentially, that's the same thing as what you're doing. It's like, I can jump a thousand different ways. So how can I be creative with what I'm limited to doing and make it stand out? And, you know, I think that really to what you're saying, I think that has to prove the point that you have to be that much more creative if you are designing within this confined space. Exactly. And I mean, the materials that we pick every season, we do something new and we're trying to elevate the product in a newer way, but still keep that product that the customer seem to really enjoy. So we have certain shapes that we know the customer loves and appreciates. And it's great organization comes out with different pouches that you can pull out, you know, toss in another bag, and then you have an empty bag. But we elevate certain materials that we're using to be more friendly for the customer today that wasn't, you know, 15 years ago. How do you think the travel case industry per se has evolved in terms of what you're doing now to, you know, these anchor pieces and the bestsellers, like how have they evolved in terms of from a consumer standpoint and saying like, oh, now we need to have a, I don't know, a pocket for chargers now. And, and I know with travel cases, like even when Away came out, they had the built in chargers and then that became a big no, no, because the suitcases were catching on right in the middle of the flight. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I had an away case and we were in the airport and they're like, you don't have the thing out inside. So we had to dump our stuff and they literally yanked it from inside the case, got a big hole in the case. And then away was offering, you know, we can fix it for a certain amount of time to that point. So how have you evolved the product? Because again, you're working with a combined space. So what are you adding on? And from a designer perspective, how are you looking at this? Certain construction aspects where as we're working with our factory, what is easier for them to construct it in on a better, I guess, elevated way, because we do have a high tolerance for good construction because we want to give our customers a good bag. So we're always elevating how we can fold certain seams or where we put a zipper and thinking about those aspects. And then also sustainability materials, just like everybody else nowadays. We're trying to use more sustainable products in our bags, which you couldn't use as wide a variety as options, you know, 10 years ago. And also the inside of a lot of right. cosmetic bags currently have a plastic coating that's PVC. So it's wipeable and easily washable on the inside. But we currently this season, we just implemented a waterproof lining that has a coating on it. So we've gotten rid of that plastic interior. And it's still that easy wipeable, but it gets rid of that, you know, plastic that's right in front of your face that kind of makes that crunch noise that not every customer wants to put their makeup next to, I guess. So we're trying to do little things like that. It may not seem like a lot, but it's bringing more, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good to the product. <laughs> Are you just out of curiosity defining your cosmetic cases for the woman who is carry-on only versus the woman who is putting it in their suitcase? Yes. I think a lot of customers now probably, especially when you spend thousands of dollars on a palette of makeup or mm -hmm. you know, certain brushes, hard cases are very good to have, but they're not malleable to fit in certain packing spaces in your luggage. So we 
think about that as well when you're packing to have a more soft bag, easily washable bag. And then also we have different sizes. So we have a large case for those women that have a lot of product and want to keep it all in one space. And we have smaller bags that are more of a, you know, little side pouch and pouches inside of the bags, I think are very fun for customers to be able to be like, I have a bag with six different pouches in it that I could pull out. And actually, I could use this pouch today in my handbag to just right. store, like my lip gloss and my brushes. So you, there's multiple ways that you can use the bag, not just in the bag itself in traveling. Do you as a team use the bags for a test drive? Yes. We're always advocating for people to use our bags within our company to try to get a read on what works and what doesn't. But I'm always asking like my friends and family because I personally don't use I'm a very minimalistic, not a whole lot of makeup. So I'm always reaching out to the, my friends and asking like, what's the new palette or going into Sephora for me is very overwhelming. Mm-hmm. But I, I have to go in there just to learn what is the new makeup item and what are people using now? We've added elastic straps into some of our bags that keep your palettes, you know, mm-hmm. fine to the bottom of the bag. So they're not, you know, moving around and jiggling which is very helpful. And you wouldn't really think about it unless you're that person using those, you know, right. or brushes. So, I mean, my makeup bags are disgusting. So <laughs> that's, that's one thing that I constantly am thinking about is cleanability and wipeability to the bag. They are disgusting because being able to when you have this thing. Well, when you have your makeup at home and, you know, you lose a cover for this and a, and a you know, a cover for that, whether it's, an eyeshadow or even a lipstick or an eyeliner like without fail my brush comes back with a big stripe through it because it was sitting in an eyeshadow and then I look like you know I'm exactly so yeah to your point I would love to understand like from a retail anthropological point of view like when you do go to Sephora and you look at the makeup cases they sell there I mean obviously Stephanie Johnson is a premium product do you take into consideration like what else is on the market and how else it's, you know, in terms of a competitive analysis? Because we always talk about this from an independent designer perspective where it's Im- almost impossible to have market share. So what can you do to have your own USP, your own unique selling point? So, you know, are you still constantly, even at this level, still doing a competitive analysis and looking what other people are doing? Like, because I'm sure that it should still have an impact. Definitely. I think that's what gives us our edge because we're constantly looking at what other people are doing. We're not trying to copy them or get any ideas from them. We're just trying to see what are they selling and what are people gravitating to because Sephora is a huge brand that women Mm. buy a lot of their products and I think they'll probably sell a lot of their cosmetic bags. But one thing with Sephora is a lot of their bags are black, which is nice because it hides the, you know, mess that your makeup can make. And it's very simple because all women love black. But we have that competitive edge of also the fashion forward of it. And it's the subtleties that we add for if we have a black case on the outside, but the inside is going to be a pop of color. And I think that touches on SJ's like core history of adding color and fashion right. to the bag. and also getting that high quality bag itself. But we're always looking at what other, you know, competitors are doing just to see you know and make sure that we're in the game but it's very simple if you think about it there's not much to a cosmetic bag but there are a lot of options out there there's simple options or very complex options do you still i mean i know back in the day when we all started i mean this was dating back to the time of sex in the city and you know, getting that TV show plug or getting in a magazine and having a reason to get excited, like, oh, this being seen on this celebrity or having them carrying this product that we could almost guarantee that there'd be a huge bump in sales and get ready and she was wearing it and this or they were wearing it and that. How do you, again, as the product that technically goes inside, how do you go about standing out? to get people's attention, right? Like just from a marketing perspective, are you involved with that? If you ever wanted to start a handbag line and didn't know where to start, this is for you. Living proof.
proof that independent designers can make it big. Uh, absolutely, Blumenthal, who is my prime example. If you had dreams of becoming a handbag designer and didn't know where to start, this is for you. If you have a handbag brand and are in need of strategy and direction, this is for you. I'm Emily Blumenthal, handbag fairy godmother and handbag designer expert, and this is Handbag Designer 101, the masterclass. Over the next 10 classes, I will break down everything you need to know how to make, market, and manufacture a handbag. Broken down for you that you'll not only skip steps in that handbag building process, but also save money in that learning curve. For the past 20 years, I've been teaching at the top fashion universities in New York City, created the Handbag Awards, and also the Handbag Designer 101 podcast. I'm going to show you like I have countless brands from sketch to sample to shelf, whether you're just starting out and don't know where to begin, or even if you have a handbag line and just need some strategic direction, the Handbag Designer 101 Masterclass is just for you. So let's get started and you will be the creator of the next it bag. Join me, Emily Blumenthal, with the Handbag Designer 101 Masterclass. We work with our marketing closely. They're literally just down the hall and we talk with them all the time. And, and in the box below. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we're always trying to think about other options that we can do to reach out to the customers. Influencers are a huge, you know, play on today's society because everybody's wanting to get feedback from somebody else that they look up to, their personal opinion on items. But I think we also sell a lot of in small boutique shops as well. And I think a lot of people appreciate that. And we appreciate that because we get those customers that may not want to shop at Nordstrom or the bigger box stores. And we're, you know, finding those niche holes in those niche cities or areas that a customer may not usually see us. So we hone into our small boutique stores a lot and we put a lot of time and effort into that. I think that's a really good point from a retail perspective that, and we've spoken about this with other brands and designers, is that don't forget about the smaller stores yeah. because they will be your litmus test in terms of sellability, in terms of trend, in terms of what the most popular styles are. And you could even like almost draw a retail map of that these colors sell well in this area and this kind of bag sells better you know, in Northern California, but in Southern Nevada, they really gravitate towards this color. And I think D to C, direct to consumer, can only get you so far in terms of understanding your customer. But I think so many people are so limited and this hope streams desires of getting into the Nordstrom's and getting into the Macy's and all of these larger stores, you're already in the minus before you even get in there. Yeah, yeah. That's not really what drives our business. I mean, we sell a lot on Nordstrom.com and other retailers, but I think those small boutique shops are really, we really appreciate them. And they also give us honest feedback. We reach out to them sometimes before we launch a season, a uh, new collection, just to get ideas and thoughts from them. Just because we're curious, we look at everything with such a closed minded you know, Hawkeye, and we're curious what right. outside people are seeing. And also, they get to interact with customers as they come into their store and they comment on things that we don't get to hear all the time. So, right, right. Yeah, I can, you're not going to get that from Nordstrom or Saks. So, do you ever do events with those boutiques? Like, you know, have a handful that you know, no matter what, like that they're big sellers and we can come up with a, a retail event to, you know, because. Their best shoppers are essentially the influencers and doing a workaround in terms of designing something that way. Yeah, actually, we have not. And I mean, that would be something to take back to my team to suggest. Just, I can talk to you back. Especially <laughs> at those, you know, small, small store days that they have after Black Friday and everything. Yeah. 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 yeah I always talk about wide open spaces because most of these boutiques always tend to, you know, they reward brands wholeheartedly that give back and 
go to the next level in terms of sales, marketing? And can we organize a wine, cheese, grapes night where you bring in your best selling customers? We can gift them the bag that they want and then they bring friends and family in and therefore you create an exclusive shopping event just for them and then make it all about the product and then have an education and like, you know, what colors do you like? And then turn this into this whole one-on-one that's an interactive shopping slash education slash, you know, PR story to go with it. People yeah. love that. So let's talk a little bit about you, Amanda. So what did you study? And did you go to school for design? Because it's so funny nowadays, so many designers at your level, a lot of them never even studied design. Or if they studied design, they studied like architecture or something that had nothing to do with what they're doing now. Yes. So I went to school for, I graduated and thought I would actually be a fine artist. I uh, painted and I draw was drawing. And then I went to a fine art school that your first year you had a foundation year and you could figure out what you wanted. And I loved fabrics and putting those together and thinking outside the box in general. So I thought I wanted to be an interior. The seat feel touch aspect. Exactly. I'm definitely a hands-on type of person. I always like to touch materials and build things physically. So then I thought I was going to be an interior designer, decided that wasn't it with all the codes and everything you have to follow. So I went towards the fashion realm and I loved it just for the, you know, hands-on aspect and building something. Mm -hmm. And my senior year, we had to collaborate and make our own line. And I actually designed my own handbags and I started my own handbag business myself that was very small. And I just kept it to friends and family and people that I knew, but I loved to make bags that were... I would work with somebody and be like, what type of pockets do you want? What type of handles do you want? What type of material do you want? And I would give that personalized aspect to that bag. So I worked for Chico's and White House Black Market and loved it. And that was just more in the clothing realm. But now I'm back to bags and it's fun to just have that box that you have a challenge to innovate and work with that along with materials. So you're getting right. both, that's the both worlds. So I really enjoy it. You know, that's so interesting because my first job was in advertising and I went out with this woman because I realized, you know, I mean, again, this was like a billion years ago, but they would have all these lunches and all these big fancy things. And it was the salespeople who had all this power and they were selling the product and the buyers, you know, it was all numbers crunching because they were just trying to figure out like, will I get an ROI for whatever I buy and to make sure that, you know, and the client that I was working on at the ad agency was Procter & Gamble. So everything was razor thin margins. They would buy the cheapest time slots for the cheapest shows or the least expensive, excuse me, not cheapest. And I was so desperate to get into the sales side because I thought that's where the glamour and the creativity comes in. And I went out with this woman who was like a senior salesperson. And she said, you would never open up a clothing store if you didn't know how to shop. And that never, ever left me. Yeah. That, you know, working for a brand like Chico's and what was the other brand you worked on? White House Black Market. Yeah. They're so big that everything you're doing, you have to be so creative on such a tight budget that it almost forces you to be 10 times more creative. Otherwise, you're just putting out more of the same, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And you're building their brand as well. I mean, just like we are with Stephen Jonathan, but exactly what you said. Yeah. So I think that kind of experience really allows you, and I'm sure it had such a big impact in terms of your design capability. Yeah. Because if you're able to do that and you know, like, like on all the fashion competition shows where they're like, you know, oh my God, I only did evening wear. Now I've got to get into outerwear. Can I do it? Ooh. And it's like, yeah, you can. It's different than saying you're a pastry chef who's now going to go into meat. Exactly. <laughs> you know? exactly. Yeah. It's like it's, your skills are transferable. Yeah. I mean, I have sewing skills since I was sewing all the time and then the material skills and it's just making your mind work a different way and thinking about products a little bit differently, which I really enjoyed, you know, that challenge. And it's a never ending challenge (laughs) because the consumer is always wanting something new. So do you still sew and paint and all of that? Do you still have that itch? 
I always have a creative itch. If you ask my husband, I'm always doing something around the house to change it up. I, I love him. him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love the color still. It's hard to sit down and start a new project. Like I would love to get back into painting or sewing, but it's something that you have to have like a few hours and it's just hard with, you know, our daily life and finding that time. But I definitely am still creative outside of work. And that's my true drive. And I don't think I'll ever stop doing that. You know what? That's a good thing to say. I think so many people think that when they have a day job, they go dead. And then if you do that, it's, it, you know, because a lot of people we speak to are the creators or the founders. And, you know, I'm so excited that we're able to speak to you who works within a brand to get your perspective because it's unique because knowing you as the senior product designer director, you have such an impact in terms of the direction of the brand. And I don't think that should be minimized that without someone like you, the brand doesn't get to go anywhere. So for all the people who listen, I think there's something to be said for working within a brand and honing those skills and understanding how the factory works and, you know, costing and landed duties and so forth, all these big things that are such animals within the industry that so many people who either get in or doing tend to overlook because you can't be creative if you don't know costs. Exactly. You, You know, you can't reach your customer if you don't know how to design into a price point. Yeah. The fun part of designing is definitely always there, but the aspect of knowing the cost and working with the factory and knowing how to construct the item itself with sewing skills and having that background and Communicating on details through email is always, you know, kind of hard and sketching. So it's not always design, which, you know, is sad. It's always it's communication and having that knowledge of costing materials, what your options are. It's a never ending, you know, rolling wheel. Can I just ask you one more question before we wrap up? I would love to talk about this and people think I'm crazy, but zippers and zipper zipper pullers, like it is the craziest thing, but I'm a little obsessed. Like the trend of pullers being oversized versus smaller versus an interior zipper. I know this is the craziest thing to talk about. Yeah. But have you noticed like with bags like this, like the, the zippers need to be invisible or they need to be bigger? Like, tell me a little bit about the zippers. I Again, I know this sounds ridiculous, but to people like us, this is crack. Like, talk to me. Uh, zipper pull. I mean, zipper pullers can make or break an item, I feel like. You can it's have- so crazy. Like, people don't even realize that. Like, no. I've seen designers have bags come in and they worked so, so hard. They spent all this money on bespoke leather from Italy and this, that, and the other. And the zipper is like some shoddy low budget zipper. I'm just like, your bag has just gone down like 90% for that alone. Yeah. And also the tangibility of the zipper. So like if you grab it and some people, just depending on your hand or your nails, it could be a very comfortable zipper or couldn't be. And that could make you steer clear of a product. And I don't think many people think about that. But like you said, if the zipper breaks on a product as well, because it's a cheaper zipper, then that stinks because then you can't get into the item. But our zippers, we always are trying to think about what our new logo and zipper is. And our zipper pullers are actually quite large, I guess, for a smaller bag. But it adds a little bit of glam to the bag. That I we think so. Very, very important to the customer. And it's actually a quite heavier puller that is good to your hand. So you don't feel like you're pulling a big opening with this tiny little, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. zipper. So it is ah. something... I think I'm so happy we were able to finish on the zipper because, (laughs) again, it is a detail that is typically overlooked, but having, I think, a a larger zipper definitely gives a zhuzh and it gives a feeling of luxe. And, uh, you know, one of the funniest things when I was learning about zippers that, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the smaller the number, the bigger the zipper. Yeah. And or opposite. Is the bigger the number, the bigger the zipper? Yes. Is it? Okay. So then I must be talking about something else. I don't know. I was working with Riri, which was the Ferrari of zippers a thousand years ago when I met them and I went up to their showroom, which was in the Empire State Building. And I felt like I was in Prada. (laughs) They were showing me all these zippers. I'm like, I don't know if I can even afford this, let alone my bag. It's the zipper. And all they kept saying is, it's the Ferrari of zipper. It's the Ferrari of zipper. I'm like, okay, well, I can't drive, let alone a stick shift. So maybe this isn't going to work out. So I don't know. There are 
trend shows that we go to or just product shows that we go to. And there are vendors that are walls and walls of zippers, zipper pullers, different types of zipper teeth how they're you know put together color yeah it's amazing the options you can you know have with something so subtle it's one of those things where you could have a black bag and you just play with the zipper zipper tape zipper teeth and you could do some very cool things you know the sports sack i believe was the first one or maybe maybe it was prada i can't remember or maybe they both did it this is i'm ashamed of my history here but that started doing the rainbow the rainbow teeth there was a trend. There was a trend of that for a while yep. in like the early two thousands. Yeah, that was like having this party tea, yeah. and then that, and then it was like the the what's the guy from the Muppets with the crazy teeth, and then the zippers were oversized. And I thought that is how you elevate a bag, right? You have the party yeah. teeth and a big puller, and that's it. Bob's your uncle. Forget yeah. it. That that <laughs> it's a make or break of a bag. Exactly. Oh my gosh. Amanda, thank you so much for being part of Handbag Designer 101, on the podcast. How can we get our hands on a Stephanie Johnson bag and learn more and just to be part of this whole travel experience with Stephanie Johnson under Ricardo Beverly Hills? You can find our bags at ricardobeverlyhills.com. And also we do have a lot of our bags on Nordstrom as well. And you can follow us on Instagram at Ricardo Beverly Hills as well to find out what our newness is and what we're doing. I just want to thank you for being part of this. Get your hands on an SJ bag. And Amanda, you've been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to rate and review and follow us on every single platform at Handbag Designer. Thanks so much. See you next time.